Uh, I'm Brenda Talent, CEO of the Show Me Institute. Thank you for joining us. The Show Me Institute is pleased to bring you today's program on China, Russia, and the changing global landscape. For those of you who don't know, the Show Me Institute is an independent research and education organization. We focus on Missouri fiscal and economic policies from a free market lens. We don't believe that more government is the solution to every problem. Instead, we promote solutions to the problems facing our citizens from the perspective of what can we do to unleash the power and creativity of individuals. You can learn more about us at showmeinstitute.org, on Facebook at Facebook backslash Show Me Institute, or on Twitter at Show Me. We're going to be taking questions during today's program. To ask a question, just look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on the Q&A box, and there you can type your question. Zach Lawhorn from Show Me Opportunity will be our moderator. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers today, Senator Jim Talent and James J. Carafano. Senator Talent brings us over 30 years of government and political experience, including service in both chambers of Congress. He's a nationally recognized leader on military affairs and for his entire career has been the biggest defense spending hawk in Washington, uh, with the possible exception of Mr. Carafano. During his service in the U.S. Senate and U.S. House, Senator Talent served in each chamber's Armed Services Committee, where he worked to advance a strong national defense and military readiness. Since leaving the Senate, he served on the Defense Policy Board, the U.S.-China Commission, two commissions reviewing the Department of Defense force sizing plans, and task force on Pentagon personnel reform and the National Security Innovation Base. He's currently the chairman of the Reagan Institute's National Leadership Council. He was also, for a number of years, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where he worked closely with our guests. James J. Carafano is a leading expert in national security and foreign policy challenges. He's the vice president of Heritage Foundation's Catherine and Shelby Cullen Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy, and he's the E.W. Richardson Fellow. Mr. Carafano is an accomplished historian. He's a teacher as well as a prolific writer and researcher. His most recent publication is Brutal War, is a study of combat in Southwest Pacific. He's also authored Wiki, um, Wiki at War, Conflict in, socially networked wor in the Socially Networked World, which is a survey of the revolutionary impact of the internet age on national security. Um, the format for today's program is that each of our guests will make a few comments, and then they're going to have a dialogue about what is happening in our world from a national security perspective. And with that, I'll turn it over to our first speaker, Senator Talent. Thank you, Brenda. It's great to be with everybody today, especially great to be with Jim Carafano. So I was wondering what to say uh, for my opening remarks and feeling, I don't know, a little bit bilious and grumpy this morning. And so I, I, um, what came into my head was a speech that Winston Churchill gave in November of 1936. This was two years before Munich. Uh, which he called the locust years. And he discussed in that speech the, um, the by then four years of crash military buildup that the Germans had been engaged in, in contrast uh, to what the British were doing, which was pretty much nothing. And Churchill called those four years the locust years, the years that were given over to the locusts, the years that were wasted when Britain could have been preparing for and therefore deterring what, what eventually we all know was the Second World War. So we have done the same thing, albeit in a different context. Uh, the problem goes back 30 years to my first year in the Congress when um, we began cutting the defense budget, in particular, the acquisition and modernization budget. Basically, we were not recapitalizing uh, the ships and planes and um, and missiles and other platforms of the Department of Defense. As a result, the defense industrial base began shrinking and consolidating with the encouragement of the government, a process which has continued to this day so that we are now, whereas we had at the end of the Cold War 55 uh, prime contractors for aerospace, we now have five. We had 13 companies that could produce missiles. We now have three. We have lost two thirds of our shipyards. That's a milkier figure because it depends on how you define 
shipyards. <clears throat> this culminated in the years 2009 through 13 when the Congress on a bipartisan basis uh, cut about a trillion dollars over uh, from the projected Department of Defense um, budgets. At the same time, the Chinese were engaging in a crash military buildup, uh, which has culminated now uh, to the point that they are the dominant military power in the Indo-Pacific. We are outgunned, outmanned, and outranged, uh, in, particularly in the East si uh, and South China Sea and really within the second island chain. Just as one example of that, uh, we're outnumbered in ships west of Hawaii by a six to one margin by the Chinese. Now the Heritage Foundation measures, in fact, I think it's the only organization outside of government that comprehensively measures every year uh, the strength of the United States Armed Forces. It's called the Index of Military Strength. I highly recommend it. And according to this year's index, for the first time ever, the Air Force is rated as very weak. Uh, the Navy is rated overall as weak. And remember, the Indo-Pacific is a na naval and air domain. So that's the situation we're in. And um, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. We are looking at what I have always defined as strategic failure, uh, the possibility of having two options either forfeiting our vital national interests or uh, being engaged in a war under very unfavorable circumstances. Now, I will say this, a, ho a hopeful sign is that Congress is definitely energized to do something about it on a bipartisan basis. Uh, they have been increasing the defense budget well above what the Biden administration has submitted, which is really good. And there are people on both sides of the, uh, of the aisle who recognize the danger and I think are prepared to do something about it. But they're running up against the iron law of international relations, which is that power is the product of intention and capability. And intention can change quickly, but capability can't. You can't flip a switch and get a missile frigate uh, or get, a, 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 long, or get a, a, a long range precision bomber uh, or a longer range cruise missile. So I'll just close by saying there were at least all throughout this entire period, no locusts at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Jim Carafano has been screaming about this almost as long as I have. Uh, and I think we've had some impact and have laid the basis for trying to come back at this late date. But my cohort here on the panel is a true American patriot and far more knowledgeable about these issues than I am. And so I will yield to him for his remarks and look forward to the dialogue we're gonna have. Uh, oh, there we go, okay. Having a little issues on muting. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the introduction. Always awesome to be with the folks at that show me and uh, real privilege to be back. Um, I, there's a, I just posted a link. There's a link to the Heritage Index of U.S. military strength if folks want to look at that. So I just briefly, I want to unpack on the three things I say all the time. Um, the first one is a guy walks into a, uh, walks into a, see his doctor. Doctor says, well, you got, you got a brain tumor, a bad heart and cancer. Which, which one do you want me to cure? Well, you're like, doc, I can, I can die from all three. I'd, I'd like you to kind of, and the reason why I say that is you know, we often have these debates in Washington, D.C. Do we worry about China? Do we worry about Russia? Or do we worry about Iran? I'll even put North Korea out there. And, you know, the answer is, is we have to worry about all of them because they all share something in common. They all want a world without America. And more importantly, that they all are the regional powers which have the ability to destabilize and threaten the regions that are most crucial in the United States. The United States is a global power with global interests and global responsibilities. The, we want the parts that connect the world to be accessible to us and relatively at peace. It doesn't mean we have to do nation building or or regime change or be the world's policeman or anything else, but we would like that Western Europe, the Middle East, and the Indo-Pacific are areas that the United States um, can gain access to and are relatively secure. And those are the three countries that most threaten the peace and stability in those part of the world, which is why we as the United States pay the most uh, attention to them which, uh, you know, gets uh, um, 
gets to the other story, which is, uh, you know, Jim said, you know, another way to say that is, is um, strategy changes faster than our force structure, right? You can flip on a dime what you want to do in different places, um, but you can only, as Don Rensfeld, fight with the with the kind of forces that you have. And so the question is, is really how much is enough? And so my third story is about the guy that goes on vacation, takes his family on vacation. They're having a great time. He runs out of money and he moves more money. So what does he do? He jumps on an airplane, flies back to his hometown, goes to the bank, gets out some more cash. No, he doesn't do that. He goes to an ATM and he just gets money out, which means that the United States, in addition to having sufficient forces and capabilities to, to deal with these three powers, and I admit they're, they're different threats and we and we deal with them in different ways and we have different footprints, but, but we not only have to have the forces and the capabilities, we have to be present in parts of the world that allow us... Uh, to, to deal with that. So we do need a footprint. And I think oftentimes we argue past each other uh, on these things. So, you know, you know, we all often famously talk, well, we don't need a military industrial complex. This threatens our democracy and everything else. As Jim pointed out, uh, the defense industry of the United States is actually not very significant in, in terms of the gross economic power of companies like Google and everything else. This was a, an interesting debate 40 years ago when defense spending was Two thirds of the federal budget under President Eisenhower, which is why he was talking about a military industrial complex. But today, defense is less than 13% of the federal budget. Defense, uh, uh, defense spending is 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 less than than three uh, percent of GDP, or about three percent of GDP. So it's not the great massive spending thing that we worry about. Um, you know, we have six trillion dollars of debt that we've added, which essentially dwarfs. What we what we spend um, on defense every year, so um, the but where so where we are and and what capabilities we have really matter. People say, well, why do we have this huge army in Europe? Well, the answer is we don't. We've been sy systematically reducing the footprint in Europe for thirty years. The forces that we have in Europe today are a fraction of what they were thirty years ago. Uh, it is not. Uh, a significant, actually, even portion of the military. 90% of the U.S. Army is in the United States. And when, when we often talk about, well, we have to pivot to the Pacific to face China. Well, I'm not really sure what that means. China, Asia is basically a maritime theater. 70% of the U.S. Navy is already in the Pacific. So it, it's not about really about moving pieces around the chessboard. It's about having sufficient capability to, to, to protect U.S. interests, uh, making sure that the pieces that are overseas facilitate that. Uh, and this, I think, gets to the real issue that, that, that I've been focused on lately, and, and I'll end here, which is it's not just about how much money we spend. It's also about how we spend it. And if there's anything that's been consistent in the last 30 years of defense planning, it's that we just basically do things in exactly the same way. And there's no capacity, no capability, really no will on the part of the U.S. Congress to really get serious about thinking about making sure that every dollar that goes into the Defense Department actually goes to defense. And we've actually been getting worse and worse and worse over the years. You know, typically, Congress will move about 2 to 3% of the defense budget around if, if when they actually fund defense. I, I don't think that's adequate. There are things that we do in the military, uh, which we've been doing the same way for decades and decades. And, and they're not efficient. We have an administration that is currently layering all, all kinds of things. We just had a, a, a service secretary come out and said the most important mission for his services is climate change. Uh, these things are, are a drag on efficient and effective spending. And I don't think facing the threat that we have with China and the world today that we can waste one defense dollar. So not only would I like to see a, a robust and serious defense budget, I'd like to see a defense, but I'd like to see it in everything we spend money on in the federal government, but particularly in defense, that every dollar we're putting in the Defense Department is delivering real capability um, to the, the men and women that are, that are defending us. So to me, I think how we spend money is getting to be just as big an issue of how much money we, we spend. And again, I just want to thank the Institute for, for organizing this uh, discussion, because I just don't think we have these enough. And, and thank you, Jim, for your, your leadership through the years in order to what a great colleague you were at Heritage for all those years. Thank you, Jim. I made so, uh, some comments in response or little notes in response to what you were saying. And I was, uh, with regard to the number of 
uh, of our forward with regard to our forward posture in Europe. I remember how shocked I was in the middle part of the last decade when you, Jim Carafano, told me, you know, we don't have a working tank in Europe. This was as of about 2014. <laughs> People talk about our massive presence in Europe. Uh, another thing I think it's important to point out is that uh, the armed forces should not be the primary go-to tool of our foreign policy. We should conduct that through the tools of diplomacy, economics, et cetera. However, they are the foundation of the other tools, which are often called the soft power tools. They give life and energy and strength to those tools to work. As George Kennan said one time, he said, look, uh, you'd be amazed at how much easier diplomacy is when you have a little armed force in the background. In other words, the ability of the armed forces to deter kinetic aggression against our interests sets the stage and empowers sanctions and diplomacy and other tools of power to, uh, you know, to have time to work. And finally, I'll just say, Jim, and you can use it if you want to, you, you may not want to, but when I get the question, what's the biggest threat we, we face? I say the biggest threat we face is thinking that we only have to concentrate on one threat at a time. Because when you do that, what happens is, I mean, the, as Jim says all the time, the aggressors get a vote about what, where they're going to do things. And they're naturally going to move to the areas which we have neglected. So, all right, let me uh, let me get to some questions. And particularly, I want to start with Ukraine, uh, Jim, because I know that's probably on the minds of a lot of people. Our, uh, our involvement there is a subject of some controversy, not in particular for you and me. But can you just take a minute and talk about the, the, the American national security interests that you think are at stake in Ukraine? Yeah, that's a, a great question. There was a, uh, a governor who shall go a name mentioned and basically put out a, a press release on this recently and it, it caused a lot of furor. And, and I think if people actually parsed it correctly, they they, they realize that, that what was saying being said is actually really not terribly remarkable. And I think it's because, you know, we've lost the language of being serious about national security and defense mm -hmm. after the Cold War. The things that the vocabulary that we used all the time to talk about these things, because, you know, for decades, we just kind of went around in la la land. We really weren't worried about things. You know, who cares if China's rising? Oh, the Russians just a, it's just a gas station that used to be a country, you know, um, you know, do we really have to worry about it? Right? And and the, the, the language, and it's not about politics, it's not about ideology, it's not about right and left, it's not about neocons and isolationists or restrainers or whatever, it's about what is best for the American people and what's the appropriate response uh, and level of um, attention and treasure and, and, and risks that you assume. And, and we de decided that because we have so many problems and it's such a big world in the prioritizing what we call interests, national interests. What's in the best interest of, of all of us, of all of America? Uh, and we would start with vital interests, which are the things that are essential to the survival of the country. The things that you, you would literally put the greatest generation on an airplane and parachute them into another country to fight for. Um, below that are things that are important that, okay, you, you might not fight World War III over this, but it's worth investing something because it's an advantage to us and our interests to do that. And then there are things that are called peripheral interests, which are, you know, kind of nice to have, you know, we'd like for this country to be our friend. So, you know, I'm willing to, you know, um, you know, maybe give them a little foreign aid or something, but, you know, it's not, you know, the most, like a super, super vital thing. And this is kind of a brutal way to kind of organize things. So for example, when you're talking about Ukraine, 44 million people fighting for their freedom, hundreds of thousands of uh, children kidnapped and, and sent back to Russia, um, casualties, losing 50% of the GDP, millions of refugees. But, but you know, our, it's our job as national security professionals to put America as our responsibility and say what's about the best for us. So mm -hmm. the reality is, is Ukraine is not a vital interest of the United States, right? It's not something we would fight World War III for. It's not a treaty ally. But if you think about it, for the entire period of the Cold War, Ukraine, Crimea, the Black Sea, they were all controlled by the Russians. We're still here, right? So, I mean, I think it's just kind of logical what, okay, it's it, it, it's not the end of the world, right? So it's not something we would fight a war over, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Um, it's important for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's important because Putin was never planning on stopping in Ukraine. 
We, I mean, if you just read his what he says and what he wants to do, his plan was to have dictatorial control over all the post-Soviet straits, influence over all, all the, uh, the, uh, the post-Soviet region, see NATO dissolve, see the United States pushed out. And that, and that does threaten our vital interest. And of course, the biggest uh, cheerleaders for this were the Chinese, because that's exactly what they want. They want a Europe that's weak and disorganized and divided and distracted uh, so they can push the United States out. So, uh, and, uh, and if you just think of it logically, you know, you, first of all, Ukraine is one of the world's greatest bread baskets. Well, we've seen what Russians do with oil blackmail. What do you think they're going to do when they control one of the world's largest and most important exporters of foodstuffs? Uh, the Black Sea is a crucial free and open space for, for transit. So these are things that are actually important to the United States. So that, that puts the debate in the right place. And I think you know, we're not going to fight World War III. We're not going to be a party to the conflict. Nobody really seriously argues that. Um, and it doesn't make sense for us to do absolutely nothing and turn our back on that and let the Chinese and the Russians do things which ultimately will hurt the United States. So the so the debate rightly is between doing nothing and going to war. And, and I think that's kind of where we are. I think it's a bit complicated because I think we have a president who's actually not a very good leader, um, hasn't done a good job maintaining bipartisan support, um, hasn't been physically responsible in, on way too many things hasn't really addressed issues about, you know, why are we there? What are we doing? What's the right level of support and everything else? So um, so we don't have the best leader dealing with this, but I, I do think if you if you just coldly logically look at this, it is in the U.S. interest to do something to support um, uh, Ukrainians in their self-defense. And we're kind of in that space. I mean, obviously, I, I would be, um, I'm much, uh, you know, I'd like to see a lot, you know, the accountability so people are really confident where things are going. We can talk about that. Um, I, you know, I'd like to see a smarter strategy and how we're supporting the Ukrainians so we can talk about that. But um, but the reality is, is what we're doing is in U.S. interest. And you can't argue that it ha actually hasn't done that. The, the Russian military has been degraded by a significant extent to the point that it'll be years before they can really talk about invading any other country again. Exactly. From a selfish standpoint, in the long term, this is actually good for the U.S. It first of all, it means that our commitments to NATO are are, are nearly as substantial over the next decade than they would have been. Um, Russia is less of a threat. Our European allies are actually doing more the kinds of things that we talked about under the last administration about burden sharing. So we're getting European allies who are kind of moving in the direction of doing their fair share. Um, so I that's why. We're we're there. And I know nobody likes war. Nobody likes to watch wars go on. And, and it's frustrating. And they want, all want to know when it ends. And I'm sympathetic to that. But, you know, we all want to ask the question that we want the answer to, like, when's this war going to end? Um, but that but but that's a question that can really only be answered by the Ukrainians and the Russians. The question that we can answer is, what is our interests? What's a reasonable investment to support those interests? And how are we getting sufficient benefit from that to make it worthwhile? Yeah, I would just, I, in fact, I wrote a column when all this started. I've written a couple of them. And to me, it's as simple as the adversary of our adversary is our friend, at least for limited purposes. And Putin, ever since he's come into power, has very deliberately made the Russian state an adversary of America's interests, not just in Europe, but really all over the world. So, of course, the Russian government is the chief state sponsor of cybercrime, for example, uh, he has built up his armed forces and repeatedly threatens, in, 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 including the, with the use of forces, our, our NATO allies, particularly in the Baltics. You know, he calls snap mobilizations uh, to threaten Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, et cetera. It's very much in our influence, in our interest to limit his influence uh, in Europe. But that's not just it. I mean, he, he now is, is, he has a foothold uh, in the Middle East because of, uh, the Obama administration, where he is an ally of uh, Iran and was before this conflict, which has opened up a pathway for Iran to resupply Hezbollah and threaten a war on the northern border of, uh, of Israel. Uh, and of course, he is the junior partner to Xi Jinping, despite the traditional Russian-Chinese enmity and hostility. Putin has looked past all that because 
he is aimed at the United States. And so he is supporting the Chinese diplomatically. They do military exercises together. They're just signing some kind of protocol today. And a year ago, they declared their unlimited friendship. So here we have a chance to weaken the Russian state and his ability to hurt our interests all over the world. And we don't have to use our armed forces. So I have to tell you, for me, uh, it was, I don't want to say it was a no brainer. And I hate the fact that Ukraine is suffering like this. But I think had we not done that, the whole world, friend and foe, would have looked at us and just thought, particularly after the Afghanistan pullout, would have just said, these guys have no idea how to prosecute and pursue their own interests. Now, I will say, I completely agree with Jim. You know, I, in fact, I think it was John Quincy Adams who said, the United States is the friend of liberty everywhere, but the guardian only of her own. So I, I do not want to go looking for monsters to slay around the world, as he also said. If this really were a localized dispute between Russia and Ukraine, and there were no broader implications, you can make a very strong case for saying that we ought to condemn it, but we ought to stay out of it. That's basically what India has done. And from India's point of view, that makes sense because Russia has not been an enemy of India's interests. So to me, this, is, uh, this was the right thing to do. And, and my concern about it is, is the irrational way the Biden administration, administration has prosecuted. And I'll just add this, and then I wanna ask you, Jim, about China as usual, we're both talking too long. And so I don't think I'm gonna be able to get to all the issues uh, that I want to get to. So when when your when your position as an administration in one month is well, we're not going to send high Mars because it might be escalatory. Which, by the way, I, Putin has actually moved very cautiously about this. I think his threats are just saber rattling. I don't think he has any intention of escalating. He didn't even want to mobilize because he's so concerned about the Russian people. Okay, but when you say one month, for example. Uh, we're not going to send HIMARS because we're concerned it's escalatory. And then two months later, you send HIMARS. What does that mean? It means in one instance or the other, you must have been wrong because you've taken a contradictory policy. And nobody in this administration seems to feel any incongruity at this. It's like, oh, well, it's okay to send it now. Well, and, and nobody in the press asked the question, well, then why wasn't it okay to send two months ago? So, Jim, I would have liked to get to what you see as battlefield prospects, but we were supposed to go, I think, Brenda, in like three minutes to other conversation. I do have to ask you uh, about Indo-PACOM and uh, about the likelihood of conflict with China. I have become a pessimist about that. And I'll just preface the question by saying Washington was shook up a couple of years ago when the outgoing commander of Indo-PACOM, which is our theater command in the Indo-Pacific, Admiral Davidson, said in testimony, I believe it was to the Senate, uh, his last testimony before leaving, that he thought the Chinese were gonna make a move on Taiwan by 2027, which has become known in Washington as the Davidson window. So what do you see about the prospects for that, Jim? Um, cheer me up. If sure. I, look, I can argue both sides of this. I can argue both sides of this question. Um, you know, there's 100 miles of very difficult ocean between China and Taiwan. And I think, you know, most of the war games show that absolutely the Chinese can cross that water. Uh, they can probably land. Uh, but can they actually conquer the entire island? That could, and especially if other people start to interfere with the logistical lines and the answers that looks like a really near run thing. So just having just what happened, watched uh, to the Russians in uh, in Ukraine, the, the Chinese have to be thinking about that. And remember, this is a military that has not fought a major conflict since the Korean War, right. it has, has almost no combat experience. And other than kind of, you know, trading punches with the Indians. So it, it it's not currently a near run thing from the, the Chinese perspective. They've got They've got two more years of Joe Biden to play with. So, you know, why risk something when you've got two more years to try to really improve your position? Um, and they've got a very aggressive strategic program. As you know, their plan is to equal or exceed the United States or or the Russian strategic, which mean, that would be an offset then. That's a that's a check. And, and their plan is to have a Navy that, that can completely outmatch the U.S. Navy and deny the U.S. access to the region. 
So these are things in the future. So I, I'm not sure you know, that that would suggest not now. Um, the reality is, is as we all know, the enemy gets a vote, and and they get to vote when they want. You know, it's kind of like Arizona. You know, you they they did decide what the rules are, and they get to decide to vote, and they can even so. And who knows when the Chinese will vote to do this? And so. Again, it's the kind of it's the wrong question. People say, "Well, when is China going to attack?" And my answer is, I don't know the answer to that question because I think that's honest. We don't. I mean, we can look at the pluses and minuses, but in the end, we don't know. But here's the here's the question I can't answer: What will it take to keep the Chinese from waking up in the morning and think they could get away with this? And that I do know the answer to, and it, and it's and it's really kind of threefold. One of is Taiwan's capacity for self defense. Which is something that I think the Taiwan Taiwanese have woken up in just the last year or so and really realized that they have to be like Ukraine. If they want people to come to their aid, they've got to demonstrate uh, to both their enemy and their friends that, that they're going to fight and they're going to be there a month from now. And so I think the Taiwanese are getting much more serious about their capacity for self-defense and how to improve that. That's important. The second thing is, again, another lesson of, of Ukraine. You want as many friends as possible. So I think it's very important for the nations of the free world, whether they actually have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan or not, because as you know, for example, we don't, but engaging them in international organizations, building economic relationships, security relationships, defense partnerships, the more of those friends that Taiwan has and the more people that make friendship with Taiwan, the better. And of course, the third thing is we need a U.S. capability in the Indo-Pacific, which denies the Chinese, the capability to keep us out of the region uh, and and denies them any confidence that they could cross the the uh, the Taiwan Straits and sustain an air or sea bridge uh, to to uh, to conquer Taiwan. If we do those three things, then we'll be in good shape. We're uh, the Taiwanese are moving in the right direction. The international community's actually been moving in the right direction. But as you know, and I know, when it comes to building out particularly the naval forces we need in the Empire Pacific, this administration has been pathetic. And we have we we were gaining some good ground under the last administration, and we've really been kind of spinning our wheels in two years. So as much as people talk about the China challenge and as much as this administration talks about, they've done nothing to really seriously send a message to the Chinese that, dude, you know, we are going to build a Navy and you are never going to be in our league. And that really worries me. Okay, we're going to go to Zach in just a second. I, I have just a couple of comments I want to make. I cannot resist. Um, and I I didn't disagree with anything Jim said. Two comments on what they're likely to do or what they might do. Number one, we're in this, you notice the aggressors have the initiative. We are waiting to see what they do. And this is what happens when, when they become, the aggressor becomes the dominant power or effectively the dominant power. The second thing that concerns me a little bit, and I'm gonna use a poker term, a couple of poker terms here. So if you're playing a stud poker hand, and I don't want anybody to think I'm in the casinos, my wife would never let me do that. I also don't wanna lose. Uh, but um, when you're playing a, a poker hand as it's developing, there are two different kinds of value the hand has. One of them is showdown value. What is the likelihood that if you show down that, you know, that if you get to the final card and everybody shows this card, that you'll win. Maybe you got the better hand. The other kind of value is called fold equity. And that's the value that, that you have in a hand where if you're looking at the cards that are appearing, that both sides can see, okay, that the other guy is looking at your cards. And if you bet, if you put the chips in the table, he he'll fold. He won't even go to showdown. And this, Jim, is what concerns me about Xi Jinping. I think you're right in terms of showdown value is a dicey thing for him. He might win, but that's unpredictable. War with the United States, the five incapables of the PLA, he's worried about all that. But when you add the showdown value to the fold equity, what's the possibility that the other side won't even go to showdown if I put the chips in the table? So I'll just throw that out there. And I do want to say, despite the fact the defense industrial base is as anemic as it is. And if there's one thing I would snap my finger or flip a switch and do if I could, it's double 
the number of attack submarines we were able to have in theater, which is pretty difficult when 30% of our submarine force can't even be deployed because it's awaiting maintenance because we don't have the shipyards, they're afraid of our superiority in the undersea domain. If, if that's the one thing I would, if I could snap my fingers and get, I would, I would do. But there are things we can do quickly. Uh, get with stockpile munitions in theater, get more uh, longer range cruise anti-ship missiles in theater. They're not expensive. We can produce them and we should be displacing them and disbursing them as much as we possibly can in islands and ships, et cetera. Harden the defenses at Anderson Air Force Base. Can we have a 360 degree missile defense uh, in Guam? Because the danger in the case of war is we're going to lose our aircraft on the ground when they attack us. And then, as you said, Jim, and I'll close with this and go to Zach, uh, turn Taiwan into a fortress. And we have to have the Taiwan's, you know, cooperation, obviously, with that, but make it as tough a nut to crack as possible. I think that I think you might be right, Jim. That might be the biggest thing, because the Chinese are not going to want, even if they can do it, to have to pursue some scorched earth policy on Taiwan that takes months and months and months and months for them to achieve. All right, Zach, we are yielding for questions. All right. Well, thank you both very much. That was great. I want to remind all of our viewers that they can submit their questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Mr. Carafano, I want to start with you. Um, the prospect of getting into an endless war in Ukraine, if that's what the situation uh, devolves into, one, does that favor Russia in the long run? And two, uh, what would you be looking for before the U.S. were to encourage Ukraine to maybe uh, pursue some diplomatic yeah. solutions. Yeah, I mean the, the problem with the kind of the endless war standard is it it asks the wrong question. When does the war end? And it measures interest by the length of the war, and that it's not the way we measure these things. It's how how are how well are U.S. interests protected, right? It's so, and it's not our war. So I I just think it's simply the wrong question. So yeah, we'd all like the war to come to edge. So let's ask the question of what leverage could the U.S. bring to stop the fighting? We have no leverage over the Russians. I was actually just with a bunch of Russians and the, the, the Russians have no interest in stopping fighting. I mean, Putin can, can continue this war if he wants to. He's just killing his own people, which apparently he doesn't care about. But, but we have no leverage over the Russians, right? We've already sanctioned them. You know, we, there's nothing else we can do to them to force them to stop fighting. And, and we have no leverage over the Ukrainians. The only leverage we have over the Ukrainians is aid. And if we stop giving them aid, then the Russians will win. So, so we really don't have leverage over either side to force them to stop fighting. What we do have leverage over is that we can ensure the Ukraine has the capacity for self-defense and the Russians can't conquer them. That's just the reality of where we are. And it's a and it's a we can debate the exact number and the efficiencies and exactly what to do, but but we're in a we're not in an unreasonable ballpark. You know, people look at the numbers and they go, oh my God, look at these numbers. But I, I think there's a lack of perspective there. Six trillion dollars in deficit spending. That's our fiscal problem. Uh, it's not what we're, we're spending in Ukraine. If you add up the fraud from the COVID relief bill and you add up the wasted money in the other major packages, it it dwarfs Ukraine spending like a plant, you know, a planet blocks out the sun. If you look at the money that it costs the United States for Biden's open border border policies, it is it is many times greater than what we're spending in Ukraine. And then people say, well, you know, we should be spending on winter on border security. Well, look, we were spending nothing on border security before the Ukraine war. If there had not been a Ukraine war, we would have been spending nothing on border security. So, uh, you know, it, we can we can debate the, the numbers and we want its efficiency. And I wouldn't spend any money unless, you know, it was proven that it was efficiently spent. But in terms of the ballpark that we're in of what we're spending to protect our interests, it, we're not in an unreasonable place. And yeah, the question, the reality. I, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, Jim, I, I interrupted. Uh, I, the, the question is what advances our interests, uh, in my view now? What's happened at this point, I would sum up the situation this way. Russia has lost. In terms of America's interest, Russia has lost. 
because their their combat power has been degraded to the point. I mean, I'm not sure. Nobody's certain how many casualties they've suffered somewhere. I mean, killed and wounded, 50 to 100,000 or, or killed, and then that many wounded, and they've lost an enormous amount of material. So it's going to take him years to reconstitute. So in that sense, in the sense of Russia vis-a-vis the United States, the Russians have lost. The problem is the Ukraines haven't won yet. And so I actually wrote about this a couple of months ago, Jim. So as the war goes on, there is going to be an increasing divergence between American interests and Ukrainians' interests, okay? It doesn't matter. Now, I would love to get Crimea back because whoever has Crimea controls the Black Sea. You know, we get that. So if, but if we have a stalemate of the battlefield for years and years, I don't think it's our in our interest to continue financing that. And I think what we want to do is work with the Ukraines. We cannot be seen as, we cannot abandon another ally or be seen as abandoning another ally for the love of heaven. I mean, you know, if you're thinking of working with the United States anywhere around the world after Afghanistan, for example, I mean, why should you? I think we should, we should begin. We're going to, the Ukraines are going to have some kind of an offensive this spring. We'll see what they do. And I would think we, sh- we sh- could begin working in the back channels for what kind of an agreement might be possible. And I think the Ukraines, for their part, could make an agreement if they got security out of it. So it ought to include, for example, a guarantee of whatever borders emerge from this, or it's admitting them to to NATO, uh, which would guarantee the borders. And I don't care whether Putin likes it or not. So the question is, at that point, how do you get Putin to the table? And this is the point Jim mentioned. We need additional points of leverage over him. There are certain things that I would like to think the administration is talking about, but they're probably not. But no, I agree with people who say, look, you know, since we've more or less accomplished our ends, um, it would be good for us if we can get this thing to a conclusion. But in the meantime, I completely agree. We need to keep supplying them. And I'm just, I'm very impatient, not with this questioner, but with people in Washington who say, well, we can't spend the money. We've spent, Jim mentioned, six trillion in deficit spending, but four trillion just in the last couple of years. And having done that and given what we spent it on and not a dime for the defense industrial base, for the Department of Defense, I just don't, you know, when those questions come up, I just say, you know, these people in Washington are not in a position to raise that that issue. So, I mean, what we've achieved already so far, I think is cheap at the cost, but we all ought to be talking about, yeah, what is the future going to look like uh, how do we finish vindicating our interests and how are we fair to our allies? Okay. If you're not, if you, that's a question of honor and interest. And if you don't keep faith with your allies, you're not going to have very many allies. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, the Ukrainians aren't stupid. I mean, there is no, and essentially there is no final victory here. The, I mean, the Ukrainians can't defeat Russia, right? They can't drive to Moscow and drive Putin out of power, right? So at the end of the day, no matter where the line ends up, the Ukrainians have to defend Ukrainian territory. So in the long term, regardless of where that final line is, the Ukrainians are going to be about defending Ukrainian territory. So there, I don't think, in a sense, that the Ukrainians are, are are going to fight an endless war or think they're going to fight an endless war. You know, you, you bring up the point of Crimea. You know, the, the point is, is, is um, regardless of who owns Crimea at this point, if, if the line... The, the the Ukrainians have taken Crimea off the table as uh, as a Russian military because base because literally everything in Crimea is now in range of Ukrainian weapons. Right. So the fact that the Russians would ever be able to confidently go, even if the war ended today, confidently able to go forward and say, well, I'm just going to continue to have naval bases and sub bases and air bases and and operate out of the Ukraine uh, Crimea just the the way I want. Um, you know, with with impunity, well, that's not going to that's not going to happen because every day they're going to be under they're going to be in range of Ukrainian weapons. And so, look, look, it's I understand the frustration of you know well, why can't we just bring this thing to a conclusion? But again, uh, you know, the reality of what's going on on the ground matters, uh, and the two sides both have the capability and the will to continue fighting. Uh, and that's the one thing that that no one can really change at this point. The thing that will get Putin to the table is if he thinks he's going to lose, or if, or or if the battle well, he's already lost, right? Ready. Something I mentioned. What could we do? Well, we could give the Ukraines the ability to hit inside Russia. 
to start hitting Russian yeah, cities. I, but you know, at the end of the day, now, I'm not sure that that changes the calculus either because they're never going to be well, but they're never going to be able to do enough to really hurt. I mean, to really substantially threaten strategically the Russians. They can hit targets in Russia, but the Russians can hit targets in Ukraine. So to me, it's a you know, that's not a magic button either to drive Putin to the table, because obviously he's demonstrated a willingness to take lots and lots of casualties. And people say, well, how, how can people continue to fight wars that they know they've lost? And the answer is, if you look through history, people do it all the time. Besides Here, which, you mentioned the, sorry, Senator Talenko. Yeah, yeah you, know, we, you want to go to the next one. I mean, Jim and I could talk about this all morning. So. Um, Mr. Chair, you, you said uh, the reality on the ground. As we hear about the potential of a Ukrainian spring offensive, what is your assessment right now of the reality on the ground? Um, well, it's clear that the, um, you know, I, I, I will, I, I predicted that the Russians would not do a winter offensive because I said what well, makes no sense for the Russian to do a winter offensive. Um, they're not going to gain substantially on our ground. They're going to plow through an enormous amount of men and material and gain virtually nothing. And they're, they're going to make themselves more vulnerable to Ukrainian counteroffensive in the spring. But did Putin listen to me? No, he did it anyway. And, and that's exactly where we are. The Russian offensive has accomplished uh, not very much. It, it has ground through a lot of uh, power. But the, the reverse is, is also true. I mean, the, the, the Ukrainians can do a counteroffensive. Um, but what the Ukrainians ought to have to be concerned about is, remember, they have to defend the entire border of Ukraine. You know, from the from the Black Sea all the way up to Belarus, and that's a lot of ground, and it requires a lot of forces. Um, what's strategically worth fighting for? You know, uh, you know, if you look at the river between Crimea and and the, the rest of Ukraine and the peninsula there, that is a big obstacle to cross, uh, and I think that would be very challenging. Could they cut? There's a land bridge that the Russians have established to Crimea. Could they cut that? Maybe. Um, and maybe that's a logical objective. But the converse side of that is the Russians know that that's the most important thing for them to hold on to. So it's the thing they're probably going to fight for the hardest. I'll be honest with you. I, I have no secret knowledge as to what the purpose of the Ukrainian counteroffensive um, is or would be. Um, you know, would it drive Putin to the negotiating table? I'm not sure there is a counteroffensive. That could could drive even if they conquered reconquered every inch of Ukraine, Putin could come back and just attack the next year. So I'm not I'm not sure there is a counteroffensive that that could force an end to the war. And uh, if there if there is a Ukrainian counteroffensive, I think it'll be for a, a, a for them to accomplish something that they believe that would give them a more defensible frontier of uh, Ukraine over the long term. Because remember, this is going to be for them be a, a decades long challenge, because as long as Putin's there, they're always going to be have to be able to defend their country from another invasion. Um, and uh, uh, until they're, they're part of NATO, I mean, we could talk about that if you want. Um, the, you know, I think once they're part of NATO, I think it's the game game's over that the Russians will never risk that we've seen this. I mean, right. You know, people worry about escalation. But the reality is, is, you know, if Putin was going to escalate the war, he would have done it by now. And he can't defeat Ukraine. He's not going to go around attacking other countries, I really don't believe. And, and I think what we've seen is his reluctance really to broaden the, the war to other NATO countries demonstrates that Ukraine, that NATO is a real deterrent to Putin. So if if Ukraine was part of NATO, I think that would be the end of this. But it's also true that NATO is never going to allow Ukraine to join NATO well, there's an active conflict going on. We've had situations before where people have been part of NATO and part of their country has been occupied. West Germany is the most famous example of that. But West Germany also agreed that they would never seek to regain their territory uh, by force of arms, right? And that's the only condition under which I think NATO would be brought into NATO. Uh, Ukraine would be brought into NATO, but, but the fighting has to stop. So again, it's another one of these conversations which isn't going to happen yet because the, the conditions for it aren't there. Yeah, we could spend. I mean, it's just I, yeah. <laughs> if if we'd had if we'd had an, a, I don't I don't think we're arguing. I'm, I'm I, that's a, that's a real statement. I mean, I it, if 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 we had because I do not want peace under circumstances uh, which do not advance America's interests on the whole, and so it has to be a peace that gives the Ukraine's security going forward. If we'd had four or five 
brigades permanently stationed in Eastern Europe with armor and the supporting infrastructure, you know, to be able to resupply. And we'd left the missile defense bases in the Czech Republic and in Poland. I mean, I think that kind of strength, uh, it's counterfactual history. I don't think he ever does this. The, the only thing I may be worth saying here is that Jim was talking about interest before. So when people talk about the vital national interests of the United States, there's usually three things. The first two are pretty easy to define. Defense of the homeland, which is much more complicated than it used to be because we're liable to cyber attacks, um, attacks from space. It's, it's, but defense of the homeland, obviously. Uh, the preservation of America's right to move, trade, and travel in the world on equal terms with everybody else. In other words, and that's what's at risk in Indo-PACOM because if the Chinese are able to dominate that, they're going to say to us, oh, uh, you want to trade with Vietnam? You do it on our terms. Oh, and by the way, you get those military bases out of Japan. You can't be there. And you're off the Korean Peninsula. And we're not so sure about you being in Guam, even if that's your, I mean, so, and we, we won't be able to tolerate that. I guarantee you, there's no president who won't defend that. And then the third, again, harder to define is the preservation of at least acceptable stability or equilibriums in like you're in the important parts of the world of which Europe is certainly one. So when you get a conflict like this, conflict is unpredictable. You know, I, Jim and I agreed, stay out of the Syrian civil war, right, Jim? We were in agreement on that. And we still think we should have stayed, and, and we did, okay? But look what happened as a result of the Syrian civil war. The migrant crisis, terribly handled by Europe. So the point is, stability in important parts of the world, an acceptable one, not stability dominated by an anti-American aggressive power, so we have a lot of interests in Ukraine. And now the issue is, as I said, how to get this thing to an end that accommodates those interests. And Jim is right. If everybody thinks that what we want is, is to end this no matter what, then it's going to end on unfavorable circumstances. And we will, again, have sacrificed everything we put in it to this point. And Senator Talent, we've talked this morning a lot about China, and obviously they're uh, watching our support of Ukraine. What do you think other adversaries specifically Iran, uh, North Korea, how important is our support of Ukraine and messaging to them? Uh, well, I, I absolutely believe that uh, what we do in one area of the world sends signals to other parts of the world about, it's, this is often phrased in terms of strength or resolution, but I think also intelligent purpose is important. In other words, can they count on us to be making decisions and back up our decisions that at least advance our own interests. Now, you know, you mentioned um, uh, you're asking about Iran, for example. The way this administration has treated the Saudis is a huge mistake, not only because we have largely forfeited what was a beneficial partnership with Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, but because the other countries are looking at this and they're saying, well, this doesn't make any sense. In other words, they're looking at what we're doing and they're saying, these people are idiots because they're, they're, they're sucking up to Iran, which is clearly an adversary. And we're criticizing and attacking countries which are, have unsavory leaders, there's no question about that, but who have common interests with the United States. So if you're India and you're thinking, and, and they have been working much more with us in Indo-PACOM, India is saying, we can't even trust these people to, to purposefully advance their own interests, okay? So consistency, intelligence, and that doesn't mean you don't do a cost-benefit analysis. Obviously you do a cost-benefit analysis. This is why Jim and I were never in favor of getting involved in Syria because the downside risks of that were too great, okay? But to, to you know, we mentioned Syria, but if, if by keeping 900 or 1,000 guys in, in Iraq and parts of Syria, we can control the threat with ISIS. We can have a forward presence that gives us influence in the region. We can, we can train up forces that are basically our friends, which is basically the Kurds, for, with 900 people who are, not in, you know, who are not engaging in combat and therefore are at low risk. Well, that's in our interest to do, is the way we would look at it. I think you would agree with that, wouldn't you, Jim, about the Syria stuff? Uh, yeah, no, I thought you put that, um, uh, you know, really, really well. I mean, um, I, you know, I particularly like the way you frame, you know, what our vital interests are. Uh, 
um, defense of the homeland, freedom of the commons, you know, and then you know, the stability of, of of critical parts of the world. I, I think that's 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 exactly right. And then the the question is 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 to have a an honest debate about how to fit, you know, what's the right mix in in those places. And I think the the problem is is actually, you know, the the reason why we've seen frustration is is political. It's not really having a clear eyed notion of what does America really need to do to deal with the likes of the Chinese, or the Russians, or the or the uh, Iranians. I mean, the reality is, is our political parties have become much more ideologically pure. And you know, in the old days, you know, Republican Democratic Party had they had hawks and they both had doves, right? And so you could actually have an on you could have a debate between them that w- essentially wasn't a political position, right? In Vietnam, the Republican Party had the the hawkish hawks, and then they had you know p- people like Jacob Davids who were most anti-war activists out there. The Democrats had people like Scoop Jackson, who was you know the probably the most strident anti-communist in the in the Congress, and then and and they had a presidential candidate who was opposed to the war. Um, the reality is, over the last thirty years, the, the the parties have become less diverse, and and what's happened now is 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 we tend to debate these things based on political views and and ideological views. Oh, well, I'm a neocon. Well, I'm an isolationist. I'm a restrainer, and and not based on kind of just the practical notions of really what's in the best America's interest. And uh, and I think that's been I, I think that's the real challenge that we face is to get beyond the politics of this. And get and be, get beyond asking the question of really what is in the best interest of the American people. And unfortunately, when you ask this administration today, they'll tell you what's in the best interest of the American people is what I want. You know, deficit spending, open borders, you know, all this other you know wacky stuff. And just just to finish up, it's like, to me that you know when people say, well, what do our allies think about us? There's this weird an enemy. So there's this weird kind of dichotomy in the world. On the one hand, they look at what the United States can do. For example, look at what we've done in in Ukraine. There wouldn't be a Ukraine today. If it wasn't for the United States, there's no way the Ukrainians could have held on to invade that country. If it wasn't for the for the USA that we military that we it's just fact. And our enemies are awed by that. They go, oh damn, these Americans, they can actually deliver. But on the other hand, they look at our political leadership, and they just oh. think they're yahoos. They make up wake up every day and they go, what can we do to put one over on Joe Biden? Oh, it's just I mean, and and that's just so you know do our enemies fear us? Or do they think we're a laughing stock? And the answer is, well, they fear America, but they think our leaders are a laughing stock. There's, there's a great irony here, and I know we're hitting up against noon. Uh, the 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 Democrat who I believe would have been the best on foreign policy, and I didn't say this when she was actually running because I didn't want to su- it to sound like I supported her, is Hillary. I, I think we would have had a much more consistent and purposeful and intelligent policy. I'm sure. A lot of people watching this are blanching at that, but I, this is what I expected uh, from you know from Biden, and it's and it's it's what we've gotten. And you know when you get this kind of signal, I do want to, w- one thing I'll just add here though, and this is true both regard to to, with, to the people, which include the the bases of both parties, and the rank and file members of Congress, because I was there. Okay, so if you have the top leadership in the administration that is explaining. Okay, this is what we want to do. This is why it is important to our country. Documenting that, backing it up, and working in the Congress to persuade people. Then if you're sitting in the Congress, you can say to yourself, well, you know what? I get it. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'll take some heat for it back home, but I'll do it. But when you have this complete lack of clarity, and you're sitting there in the Congress, and maybe your primary committee assignment is the... uh, the, the, you know, the science has nothing to do with national security and your people back home are screaming at you to do something. You're, you are going to default to the political imperative. Right. And, and you know, for one thing, if you're going to stand before a base of your people and explain why you're doing something they don't like, you need to understand why. So if the administration I went through this in the 90s a lot, you know, when I supported some of the stuff that Clinton did because they actually convinced me. And then I could go home and talk about it. But when you have leadership like this, yeah, you're right. You're going to default to the basic politics, Jim. And that's what we're seeing in, in much of the Congress. All right. Well, we want to be respectful of your time. Thank you both very, very much. That was uh, very informative. And I'll turn it back over to Brenda. Uh, 
I want to thank you all for joining us, and I want to especially thank our guests for a very informative program. We're going to be posting a video of today's discussion at showmeinstitute.org. We also have some in-person events coming up. Jason Riley, the Wall Street Journal and the Manhattan Institute is going to be joining us for a lecture on April 19th uh, here in St. Louis. Please go to our events page at showmeinstitute.org to learn more about that. Again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day.